Oh my god, good day! Welcome back, my name is Mickey Joe. I'm obsessed with all things theatre, and today we are going to be talking about an original Australian musical that recently transferred to London. It has just opened at the Lyric Hammersmith. I am talking about fangirls. And I have been aware of this show for some time. This show is particularly notable in that I think this is the first Australian musical I became aware of before it had ever transferred anywhere else. So a show like Priscilla Queen of the Desert, which originated in Australia, I found out about it by the time that it had come to the West End and I saw it on tour and whatever. This show I was already hearing great things about while it was in Australia, prior to any kind of an international transfer. It is also one of the few musicals to have book, music, and lyrics written by one individual. That individual is Eve Blake, which is also pretty exciting because among those musicals that have been written solely by one individual, few of them have been written entirely by women. So, yay for fangirls. Now, the show has enjoyed a tremendous amount of success in Australia with sold out performances and encore runs, and has now managed to transfer all the way to London on the other side of the world. And it's arrived as part of a very exciting but very busy summer of London theatre. So, how good is this show? Does it stand up against new openings like Mean Girls and the original musicals happening here, like Two Strangers Carry a Cake Across New York and everything else we have going on? Well, today I'm going to let you know. I was hugely looking forward to this show. Did it live up to my high, high expectations? you will find out. Now, if you enjoyed today's review, make sure to follow me wherever you are enjoying it. If you are seeing this as a video on my theatre-themed YouTube channel, make sure to hit subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss any of my upcoming videos. Not just reviews, but also theatre-going vlogs, interviews, and my coverage of theatre news. And if you are listening to this on a podcast platform, then hello to you. Make sure to follow me there as well. And while you're at it, feel free to go and find me across the rest of the internet. You can also follow me at Mickey Joe Theatre on Instagram, TikTok, and the app formerly known as Twitter. In the meantime, Meantime, let's talk all about fangirls, but before I tell you my opinion, I would like to know yours. If you have seen this already at the Lyric Hammersmith, let me know all of your thoughts and feelings about the performance in the comments down below. And if you got to see this in Australia, please let us know all about that production as well. For now though, here is what I thought of fangirls. So first of all, as I always do, let me give you a little bit of context about this show and what inspired it, because I got to go to a little rehearsal preview of the show prior to seeing the press performance, and that was very insightful and helped me understand where this show was coming from. So the inspiration for this show came on the day that it was announced that Zayn Malik was leaving the band One Direction, which honestly, you had to be there. Even if you weren't hugely emotionally invested in the group at the time, it was a, it was a very momentous day. This was back in 2015, and Eve Blake cited this global heartbreak as the inspiration for fangirls, particularly how the reaction to the band's dissolution was reported on by the media, because there was a lot of coverage of these sort of hysterical and ridiculous histrionic reactions from the young girls who were following the group. And it was apparently Eve's eagerness to unpack the way that these fangirls were portrayed in the media that prompted the inspiration for the show. And I've been thinking about it, and somehow I think, especially in the world of mainstream musical theatre, this is still pretty untrodden ground. And shows like Heathers and Mean Girls and other musicals featuring teenage female protagonists, you know, they talk about the relationships and the dynamics between young women and uh, sort of the unique challenges that they face in a school environment and at home and all of these other things. But I don't think that like fan culture for that demographic has ever been really thoroughly explored and specifically from this perspective trying to you know affirm its validity and question the way that people react to it. One of the last things I expected this show to be was eye-opening but we will get to all of that. Let me tell you a little bit about these characters and the plot. So our central protagonist is named Edna. I will be slipping into an Australian accent throughout this review. I absolutely can't help it and I apologise in advance. She is a scholarship student at an affluent school that she says she didn't particularly want to go to, but her mum uh, was very eager for her to go to. Her mum is very proud of her for her, her academic achievements and because of that pushes her to work very hard. Edna's main focus, however, is writing fantastical imaginary fan fiction about her and Harry, the lead singer of a popular boy band named Named Heartbreak Nation. Now it's at this point I have to enlighten you about the parallels between them and One Direction. This is for all intents and purposes Harry Styles and One Direction, but the band has been given a different name even if he hasn't.
doesn't. And this is made pretty clear throughout the show. Not only is his depiction very familiar, but they talk about his backstory. They talk about him auditioning for a British talent show at an early age and being uh, grouped together with four other boys who, and I quote, can't sing as well as him but have great hair. By the time we meet them in the musical Fangirls, they are already hugely successful and about to announce Australian tour dates, which is going to send Edna and her friends and many other young people across the country into a tailspin. Edna, meanwhile, is convinced that she can glimpse a sadness and a desperation behind his eyes, that he is actually trapped in this life and he longs for some kind of escape, which she believes she can help him find. We'll come back to that later because it's important. Meanwhile, she is having issues at school. Her friend Jules, whose parents are getting a divorce, is uh, treating her unkindly this year for reasons that she can't quite perceive. In reality, Jules has suddenly become interested in getting male attention and is concerned that Edna's fan fiction and uh, sort of parasocial relationship with Harry and the band is going to be off-putting to prospective young male suitors. This slightly fractured friendship trio is completed by Brianna, who is something of a leaf in the breeze and is really going to do what anyone tells her, which mostly means following Jules, who is the stronger personality. To cope with this loneliness and confusion, Edna turns to her love for the band and for Harry, as many other young people do around her as well. We hear these other voices throughout the show, uh, used to both comic and sincere effect. We hear about how they fell in love with the band. We also hear about the issues that they are all navigating and how, you know, the care that they have for this group and this fandom helps them get through that in their own way. Edna's seemingly single mother, meanwhile, doesn't really understand her daughter's devotion. Now, if you don't want any spoilers for the rest of this plot, skip ahead to where I talk about the performances, because in this, and probably the next section as well, I am going to talk about what happens next in the show and kind of what it turns into. So after concert tickets go on sale and Jules's mom is only able to buy two, which Jules and Brianna will use to go to the concert together, leaving Edna with no way to go because her mother refuses to buy tickets for her because she says that it's extortionate. Edna extrapolates an idea from her recent fan fiction and turns it into an entire scheme to go and kidnap Harry and help him escape from his life. When she actually pulls this off, however, she is surprised at how reluctant he is to go on the run with her. Meanwhile, there is an outpouring of love and despair from the rest of the fans worldwide who are horrified to learn of his disappearance. This turns dark, sinister, and a little bit aggressive. But in seeing this coverage, Edna's mother is also able to understand the intensity of her feelings for the band and what this means to her. And she's sort of able to connect with her daughter on a deeper level. Through all of this and through everything that it's saying about fan culture and about fangirls and about teenage girl friendships and the insecurities that lie beneath all of their behavior towards each other, there is a really beautiful story about Edna and her mother coming to understand each other and coming back together after this rift in their relationship. Now I want to talk a little bit about the material. The music is very contemporary musical theatre, it's very pop as you would expect it to be given all of the themes. The writing for the boy band inspired numbers is some of the best in this show. There is a brilliant hook of a song that they sing that is also uh, a song that their fans sing about them. They're singing about the band, nobody loves you like me. And then that turns into a slightly faster version for the boy band number. Nobody loves you, not like I do. It's a great hook, honestly, Wood Club, 10 out of 10. And as well as a bunch of other contemporary up-tempo numbers, there are also a handful of meaningful ballads where we get to see these characters, you know, in a more introspective, philosophical mode. There are moments that feel necessarily sinister and a little bit contemplative and even a little bit ethereal. The whole thing is more than a little bit wacky, which very much aligns with my understanding of Australian comedic tone. And it is, in my very limited experience, a little different from uh, American or British comedy. I'm thinking of like the Baz Luhrmann films that are Australian set, like Australia itself and Strictly Ballroom. And this is cut from a similar cloth for sure. It's a little bit wacky in a very wonderful way. It's a little bit outrageous. These characters are extreme, the language is blunt, and the whole thing ventures to some pretty wild places. And the majority of the songs have comedic lyrics, sometimes in an obvious way, sometimes a little bit more tongue-in-cheek. Going back to some of those boy band numbers, we get a medley of a handful of their songs 
at the top of the second act and they're not really played for laughs because they are just performed and staged very convincingly well like you just buy this as a legitimate boy band moment but it's such good parody and there is one song in particular where they're singing like think of the children and these lyrics just killed me because it's such deliberately generic like the children are not okay won't someone think of the children just about nothing whatsoever and just this empty pointless pop star activism hilarious also important to point out that in many of the slower ballads the lyrics feel like they are within the teenage voice Voice, which is also important for this show, which is very much articulating meaningfully and authentically the feelings of these teenage characters. But it is always going to be a slightly fraught marriage with like up tempo contemporary music and comedic lyrics like this is it's not impossible but it's a challenging thing to do well especially when you add in all of the components of this creative production and that it sounds like a concert and that you have this very high energy uh, contemporary choreography and you have all of this lighting and you have these screens and i'll tell you about this all in the next section but the whole thing is very visually stimulating and there's a lot of sound going on and so picking out little ironic comedic lyrics amongst all of that is challenging. They're not necessarily brought easily to the surface or consistently easy to hear. So we laugh more at the book scenes than we do at the lyrics. Or if we're laughing, it's because of the way that they're being performed. It's because of the characterization and the personalities rather than the things that are specifically being sung. I also think the first act might be that little bit too long. I think we could probably afford to lose one of the ballads and maybe one of the ensemble songs about their love for the band because, and they give you slightly different things each time. Like we start to learn a little bit more about the relationship of these fans to the band and how much they mean to them. And we start to sort of peel away the layers, but it's like a past the parcel that goes round the circle one too many times at a birthday party and the grown-ups just want to send everyone home and have a drink and that's us wanting to get to the interval I think because you know, we're peeling away these layers slowly but it's like they really love this band they really love this band and they want tickets they really love this band and they didn't get tickets but it means a lot like there's just so many iterations of these songs I think we could do with just one less of those this relationship between Edna and Jules and Brianna never really feels substantiated in the the first place and earned. We don't feel the weight of them acting unkindly towards her because the first time we see them all together Jules is already annoyed at her and Jules is already being mean to her. Then we see them together again and they're talking about getting tickets and they seem to be friends again but then everything's bad again by the time that they next come back together. And Edna is singing about how they used to be before, which is all very well, but we haven't seen it as an audience, so we don't really feel party to that. The other qualm I have is that the first act ending with Edna abducting Harry from the concert makes sense. It puts us in a place of dramatic tension before the second act. We flash back a bit at the top of the second act and lead into that abduction, and then her getting him back to her bedroom. And this sets us up for just like classic comedy sketch territory. It's a concept you can do an awful lot with. You have this like 14 year old girl who has gone to this concert and kidnapped the lead singer of a hugely successful boy band and he is tied up on her bed and I feel like we never really get to the comedy that you could find out of all of that. Like they find humor in him trying to escape and him sort of being a little bit puzzled by her telling him about the sadness that she perceives in his life. Frustratingly, we never really get to the crux of that conversation either, because the whole way through the first act, she's been trying to tell everyone how he has depression eyes, and all we are waiting for in this scene is for her to say to him, but you have depression eyes, and for him to say either yes I do or no I don't. But one way or another, he never really addresses it. In fact, on the original cast recording, it sounds as though when she sings to him, I know all about the pills and I know all about your sadness, he has a line in the middle of that where he says, um, and how do you know that? Where it sounds like, what are you talking about? But in this production, he seems a little taken aback as if, you know, it's legitimate and she actually is onto something in the way that he says, how do you know that? Oh my gosh. So it's interesting that that might shift where we are a little bit because, I don't know, does it make it harder if he actually has a sadness and he wants to run away? Or does he need to then say to her, like, yeah, it's difficult sometimes, but that doesn't mean I want to escape across the country and dye my hair and go on the run with a 14-year-old Australian girl who I've never met. Like, I just think we need to talk about it. I do like the way it leads into different material and he says something offhand that then sends her into an introspective moment that Jules and Brianna then become party to as well because the three of them all sing about, you know, worrying 
something about the way that they are perceived. This again is in a slightly dodgy territory because it's a very meaningful and personal song, but it has a little bit of comedy in its late lyrics as well when they are singing about all of the names that they worry about being called and some of them are just so ridiculous that we don't know whether we're meant to be taking this seriously or finding it a little bit funny. We're also in the midst of this crazy situation as well and that ultimately doesn't really become a crystallizing moment that brings the three of them together. That will happen afterwards so it does just feel like we're pausing the plot for less effective reasons than we could be. Now all of this being said I did have a really great time with this show. I love the different narratives that it brings together. I love that we have this relationship with her friends that we look at. I love that it brings her mum into it as well and I love that underneath all of that we have the rest of the fans depicted worldwide. I do sort of wish, given the inspiration for the show, that we got to the main point of the thing faster because it's only right towards the end of the second act that we address the way that their hysteria about his disappearance and abduction is being reported in the media and them talking about how, you know, why is it okay for their brothers to cry over a football result but they're being called hysterical for getting upset about a boy band that they care about very much in this sort of uh, gender-based double standard. It's great material, it just comes maybe a little bit late in the show after we've been potentially positioned to laugh about how intense they feel about the band up to that point. Eve describes the show very smartly as being a Trojan horse, a show that looks one way on the outside and presents one idea and then begins to reveal a sort of a, a hidden meaning and a greater purpose. And it does, just not as substantially as I would like it to. It's kind of like a Trojan horse that only had a couple of people inside, which needless to say would not have worked out well for them. For me, I think if anything was inside the Trojan horse, it wasn't necessarily the idea of beginning to question the way that fangirls are portrayed in the media. It was this relationship between Edna and her mother. That's the thing that came through the most powerfully for me in this production and it's the through line from uh, them singing about Harry and the band Nobody Loves You Like Me to hearing the boy band version Nobody Loves You Not Like I Do to then hearing her mum sing Edna Nobody Loves You Like Me. You have this confused and lonely teenage girl who has been rejecting her mum's attempts to just kind of connect with her and get to know her and it takes the mum perceiving all of this and all of this stuff that's going on and really approaching her on her level to mend their relationship and that's my favorite thing about this show. I do need to give her a huge amount of credit for the way that these book scenes are written and these lyrics. They are so out there, they are so fun and they do really brilliantly capture the intensity of that young fan voice and that devotion in the song Actually Dead. I was so charmed by these lyrics and so entertained by the speed at which, you know, their love for this group can turn on a dime into enormous frustration just because the tickets are too expensive or because they're going on sale during school hours or because the venues that they're visiting aren't near enough to the places that they live. And it's this enormous passion that you feel in this song. And again, it just sounds how young people actually speak, which I always like. But it's also a heightened version of that. Like at the end of the song when they think they are going to get tickets and they're singing Identify My Body Because I Think I'm Dead. And it's it's very fun. But like I said, I honestly did have a great time. I do really want to go back and see this show again. The whole thing is such a vibe. And a big part of that is also the way that this production has been brought to the stage. So let me tell you about that now. So this production has been directed by Paige Rattray, very experienced Australian director, designed by David Fleischer, and choreographed by the prolific pop choreographer and collaborator of Beyonce's Ebony Williams. And there is an enormous dance language in this production. The extents of this contemporary choreography are enormous. You have this hugely talented ensemble, which I will tell you about in the next section when I talk about the performances, but they are executing this high energy, dynamic, angular contemporary choreography with such urgency and passion and feeling. There's bits of like voguing in there and it's just really full out dance in a way that you might not expect for this kind of a musical. This again is one of those elements that maybe distracts on occasion from some of the comedy in the lyric but it's really damn entertaining to look at and it gives the thing such a pulse and such an energy and it makes us feel like we're at a concert which is what the show positions us to do in the second act and is what the set designed by David Fleischer positions us to do as well. We have this one scaffolding structure leaning out over the audience. There are three horizontal 
horizontal panels that make up an overall composite screen in the background that shows pre-recorded footage and I think occasionally live footage, but it's hard to say. It also shows a bunch of different graphics moving us between different locations. There's an LED floor as well. I think you're only going to really see that if you're sat in the circle of the Lyric Hammersmith. I was in the stalls, uh, so I couldn't really see what was on that. But it's a really cool, very contemporary set design, and the whole production feels just like a little bit of an augmentation, especially technologically and aesthetically, of uh, what I've seen of the production back in Australia. And I don't know if in that it's lost the littlest bit of its identity. Like, I love being able to shift into this zone where it feels like a pop concert, and they even have cast members in the interval going around and getting people hyped up for the concert and teaching them dance moves that they're going to do. So when this happens at the start of the second act, it's a huge moment in the theatre. Like, that really puts us in that kind of a space, which is really cool. And it means the energy in the audience throughout the show is great, and the whole thing feels like this amazing adrenaline high. But I do wonder if somewhere along the way, and making it look expensive and giving it this really sleek contemporary music video choreography, it's lost a little bit of its quirky, slightly wacky character. I don't know. Having not seen the production before, it's really hard to say. But what this material seems to speak to is that kind of an individuality. Like, if Edna and her friends look great and are dancing in a way that looks really cool, then you don't feel the need for them to be saying this has to be the best night of our lives because, like, we don't have any boyfriends and no one thinks we're pretty and you don't feel like they are outcasts and othered for caring as much about the band as they do. We also kind of only meet characters on stage who care loads about this band so it doesn't feel like something that would make them unpopular. And it means that when we get into this whole abduction plot in the second act, the whole thing takes a really hard turn into this slightly disorientating place because it's been, you know, very slickly presented up till then and it suddenly feels a little bit wacky and I just want the whole thing to feel wackier. I think, you know, it can look this way and we can have this choreography, I just, I think there's a small amount of its charm that it may be left in Australia. Let's talk about the performances. So Jasmine Elcock plays Edna with a tremendous confidence and a conviction and is that little bit unusual. I just wish that uh, there was a little bit more charm there because there is such a seriousness and such an intention and we meet her, you know, not getting on with her friends, not being understood by those around her and being really abrupt with her mum, which does not endear you to her as a character and maybe I would have felt differently if I was watching this show as a teenager and that is predominantly the audience that this is for which is something that's super important to remember throughout everything I'm saying in this review by the way I like her scenes with Harry I really like these moments where she's creating and imagining the fan fiction I like her interaction with Salty Pringle this fan fiction writing friend that she makes online I just think if this was a broader more ridiculous comic depiction and there's honestly space for almost all of them in the show to go bigger with this comedy this very Australian comedy style, I think it could be wackier, it could be more out there, it could be more zany. That's what the material seems to beget, and there are moments of sincerity in the thing, for sure, but those other moments, if they were broader, then we would feel the sincerity more acutely. More to the point, we would also be on Edna's side, and I wish that I was, but for most of this show, I just don't know that I am. There's a discernible sort of a disingenuousness to the way that she talks about her relationships with the band being different to everyone else's because she says I see past the hair and I see past all of this and they just care about you because you're famous but I don't and then you know we see Harry flicking his hair and the way that it affects her we can tell that that's not entirely the truth but it never gets particularly addressed. Now let's talk about her friends. Mary Malone and Miracle Chance play Jules and Brianna. Miracle Chance does lovely work as Brianna here gets one of the less showy parts I think because it's a sort of a more one note slightly whiny characterization and Miracle can be big and crazy and zany and feels slightly reined in by the character that she has here. She's an absolutely wild performer and she's also hilarious and we get to see that here as well but someone who does have a really big character and just shines with it is Mary Malone as Jules. I think that Mary is just a, such a bloody star. She is fantastic in the show even kind of playing a bully honestly she makes every single line of this dialogue 
sing. It is so beautifully dramatic, the way that she is whipping that ponytail around and marching in a huff across the stage and exploding into histrionics and this phone call moment that she has with her mom where she's blackmailing her about her divorce from her dad in order to get concert tickets. She is fantastic in this show and a huge star to watch on the theatre scene. But she's not the only one. Thomas Grant, who plays Harry, of, um, I was going to say One Direction, but that's not the name of the band in the show. Heartbreak Nation, there you go, does such a good job giving you believable boy band frontman. Oh my gosh, he is so charmingly funny in those scenes in the second act. In the first act, we only really get to see him performing these boy band numbers, but he does a great job of that as well. The choreography, the vocals, the like whistle Tony falsetto moments that he does in there, sounds great, looks the part. At the start of the thing, there's this fantasy sequence where him and Edna are escaping on a motorbike together and then he fights off a bunch of police officers. And the athleticism of this like fight choreography, so impressive. He blew my mind consistently in this show. I was like, I'm watching one of the most talented individuals on the planet because it just everything he does on that stage, it works because you believe he is this like teen heartthrob superstar. Can we also please discuss Debbie Currup because I just love her. She is an icon in the industry and you know, we'll talk about everything she does as Edna's mum, but just the track that she has in this show where she also plays this dancing zombie. She also plays one of the boy band members because a lot of the ensemble double up for the other members of the boy band around Harry at the start of the second act. Only Debbie Currup could like land all of these things and just convincingly do them well. But everything she does as Edna's mum, there is such a frustration battling with a love and a tenderness there. We see her really trying and really pushing and just getting knocked back consistently. Your heart breaks for her. And then this final breakthrough moment that she has where she realizes what it means to Edna. And then this final way that they connect. It's such a satisfying performance. Debbie is fantastic. She's going to be in Devil Wears Prada when that comes to the West End later this year as like the alternate or the standby Miranda Priestley. Uh, so make sure you go see her in that show as well because Debbie Currup will always give it to you on stage. As will Gracie McGonagall. Now Gracie was seen uh, recently in The Little Big Things, is astonishingly good in this. Basically her role in this is every time we hear from the fans, we tend to hear from her first and she plays a 13 year old character who refers to herself as Harry's wife and calls him Harold. It's so funny. And she gets these huge like vocal riff moments as well, very Heather style where she's like pushing people over and she's like, I'm gonna sing this riff. The vocals are to die for. Gracie McGonagall has always been an enormous vocal talent, but the way that it's characterized with this mania in the eyes, she's so funny. She's perfectly cast in this genuinely seen stealing stuff every time she comes on stage. I just love her. She's fantastic in this show and I can't wait to see what she does next. I will also say this entire ensemble, every single one of them, so talented, so exciting, so much personality in each of their roles. Lena Patty Jones in particular, just like an ensemble standout, hilarious, but they are all really exciting dynamic talents. Like this is one of my favorite casts to watch on stage right now. So finally, having given you a bunch of notes about this show, I want to tell you who should go and see this. And that is everyone who has ever been a teenage girl or is currently a teenage girl or has felt adjacent to that world. If you have been the parent of someone like one of these characters, if you have been the friend of someone like one of these characters, it's such a brilliant depiction of that really intense fan relationship. I have never seen fan fiction talked about so extensively or so accurately in musical theater before. And I'm someone who used to read and write a little bit of fan fiction. I'm not telling you where you can find it. Absolutely not. I'm also not telling you what musical it was about. It was Cats, but it's really fun. It's really exciting. The vibes are great. And it actually delivers on those conversations. Like I sort of roll my eyes the littlest bit every time a show like Heather's, which I do enjoy, says that, you know, it talks about uh, mental, teenage mental health and bullying and young adult issues and it doesn't really not in a way that feels positive or is actually a substantial conversation because people still go to that show cosplaying as serial killers and suicide victims and bullies like if the takeaway from Heather's are just like vibes and aesthetics this one actually feels like it gets to a meaningful place I would love for it to get there a little bit earlier in a way that feels a little bit more substantial but there are still so many great things to take away from this show and it's entertaining the vibes 
are so good. If you want to go to a show that is part throwback nostalgic concert that's going to make you feel like you're jumping around your teenage bedroom and is also a refreshing dialogue about the misogynistic way that young women's enthusiasms and passions have been historically discussed, go and see Fangirls at the Lyric Hammersmith this summer. In the meantime, thank you so much for taking the time to watch or listen to this review. I hope that you have enjoyed. Remember to subscribe uh, if you're watching this on YouTube. Make sure to follow if you're hearing me on a podcast platform and comment down below with all of your thoughts and feelings. I hope that everyone is staying safe and that you have a stagey day. For 10 more seconds, I'm Mickey Joe Theatre. Oh my god, hey, thanks for watching. Have a stagey day. Subscribe! <laughs>